Good morning. It's Wednesday, the 2nd of August, and I'm coming to you from Mumbai, India's financial capital. Our top stories and themes for the day. Goods and service tax or GST collections top 165,000 crores. Will this momentum hold? Demand for gold set to slip this year. Meanwhile, Indian markets also fall on the 1st of August. A new bill aims to decriminalize draconian laws that hurt business. Is it enough? And another Indian airline gets set to fly international. This is a core report with Govind Raj Athiraj. GST collections rise above the 165,000 crore mark. India's gross goods and service tax collections, or GST collections, grew 11% in July, touching 165,000 crores, according to data from the government released on Tuesday. Now, India has been seeing collections above the 150,000 crore mark since February 2023, and this is the fifth time collections have been over the 1.6 lakh crore or 160,000 crore rupee mark since the inception of GST in 2017. Now, the average GST collection in the first quarter of 2023-24, the fiscal year, was over 1,61,000 crores. The highest ever collection ever recorded was in April for transactions in March 2023 when gross GST revenues stood at 1,87,000 or 187,000 crores. So that's the target we need to watch for. Now, Maharashtra, the state of which Mumbai is the capital where this podcast comes from, saw an 18% annual growth to 26,064 crores and is also at the top of the table. Karnataka registered the second highest state revenues at 11,500 crores, which was a 17% year-on-year growth, followed by Gujarat at 9,787 crores. To get a sense on how to view these overall GST numbers in terms of trends and trajectory, I reached out to Dinesh Kanabar, founder and CEO of tax firm Dhruva Advisors, and began by asking him how he was viewing these numbers. Earlier, there was a perception that maybe there was a little bit of inflation impact, and therefore, to that extent, one should discount the increase in collection. I think inflation is moderately under control. It continues to be there. But as Reza Bank points out, and I think that's the reality on the ground also, we are seeing no more than 5-6% inflation, barring an odd tomato issue, which we'll leave out of our discussion. But take, for example, real estate. And Boeing, you have seen how real estate sales have grown now, when one sells a house or an office, in a large house or a large office, along with it goes furnishing, capital goods, flooring, everything else. So what we are seeing is a tremendous rise in consumption without an element of doubt. That is fueling growth. You again read about how World Bank has marginally up our GDP increase. So all of that, what you see in GST collection is a manifestation of the fact that there is a degree of optimism around, there is a degree of expenditure around, and people sort of are loosening their purse strings and are spending money. And a large part of that is capital expenditure, a large part of that is infra spending, all of which is contributing to the GST collections. There are small and medium enterprises, there are large companies, and there are, of course, individuals, all of whom are contributing to the indirect tax net. Are you seeing any trends within that? At this point of time, the trend seems to be more towards high-end consumption than towards low-end consumption. Again, going there, I'm not an economist, but what I see really is expenditure on high-end products, luxury products, high-end residential houses, all of that is just unabated. And that's what's driving or keeping the GST figures high, is what you would say. That's right. That's right. There is also this one issue, I would say, that is contributing as a one-off thing. It has been a consistent thing that with the more and more formalizing of the economy, more and more people unable to keep out of the GST net is also really resulting in sort of more and more people wanting to ensure that they are compliant. On that point, now, there are also a lot of actions that are taking place in terms of cracking down, arrests, uh, and so on. So what's your sense? I mean, is there still a lot of leakage as it appears to be, or are we in better control of that today than before? There is a reality that today the tax office is using data far more than it ever was. And therefore, what tends to happen is that if there is any leakage anywhere, it comes to the fore immediately rather than having to wait for months and until an audit 
there is also a little bit of a challenge in the sense that sometimes one finds tax office going berserk on minor non compliance etc but to leave that aside and, and those cases of course get blown up and so the sort of cases which come to us but today one does see that there is a absolute focus on non compliance and that is coming that is abating quite a bit so let me put that differently maybe it's more of a macroeconomic question but how much leakage do you think there still is and to some extent are we now peaking at gst collections at least at the current state of the economy to your first question as to how much leakage is that i really do not know i wish i could give you a authentic answer but if you go back and say that what is the ratio of formal economy to the informal economy and that is sort of coming down that is a reflection of how much collection and to the issue on peaking i really do not think so boven i do not see that we are peak because the growth in economy fueled its own rise so if you are growing at 6% then there is no way your consumption will not grow at 10 to 12% and if that happens there is no reason why gst collection will not keep on growing up i also asked dinesh kanabar what he felt about the individual tax returns that closed on monday or the night of july 31st which saw over 65 million indians filing their returns so i think one thing for which the tax office needs to be complimented is that while there continue to be glitches in the portal the glitches this year were far far more contained than it ever was in the past personally i don't get into a lot of individual taxes but i do speak to people and the sense that i get is that people were this time sure that there is not going to be an extension the government was very clear from day one that you are not going to extend the date of 31st july people started sort of filing in returns and i spoke to people virtually at least a week before the last date they were sort of just waiting for a few small things but were ready by and large so that made a lot of difference again a lot of things being formalized going a lot of things where people are reporting income uh the fact that we have gone up in terms of exemption limit and yet there are higher returns just shows that there are far more people who have come into the tax net right and i guess that should sum up that part for today uh, mr kanabar thank you so much for joining me thank you speaking of collections the reserve bank of india said on tuesday that 88% of the highest denomination 2000 rupee currency notes worth around 340000 crores or 3.14 trillion rupees have been returned since its decision to demonetize and withdraw them from circulation in case you forgot though i'm sure you did not the reserve bank of india in may sprung an announcement to withdraw these high value notes permitting their exchange or deposit until september 30th and that is roughly 60 days from now in case you were still holding on to them the total value of 2000 rupee notes still in circulation was down to about 3.56 trillion rupees as of may 19th from 3.62 trillion rupees as of march 31st the end of the last financial year the central bank said currently about 420 billion rupees worth of these notes are in circulation the reserve bank added now the data collected from major banks indicates that about 87% of these bank notes received by lenders was in the form of deposits while around 13% had been exchanged for other denominations so there's a lot of money floating around in the banking system which wasn't there earlier the 2000 rupee notes by the way were introduced in 2016 after the big demonetization move then Other data points to quickly pick up on India's manufacturing sector activity continued to expand in July compared to June although the S&P Global Purchasing Managers Index edged down marginally to 57.7 data released on August 1 showed the purchasing managers index is known as PMI the manufacturing PMI stood at 57.8 in June and that is the number to focus on as the gauge of manufacturing activity in this case in July being above the key level of 50 which separates expansion in activity from contraction and now for the 25th month in a row the indian manufacturing sector showed little sign of losing growth momentum in july as production lines continue to motor on the back of strong new order growth said andrew harker economics director at snp global market intelligence as quoted by news reports all in all the indian manufacturing sector has maintained its position as one of the star performers globally bucking the trend of demand weakness seen in other parts of the world harker said Now manufacturing is up as we pointed out by our PMI but demand for gold is down. 
India's gold demand in 2023 could fall 10% from a year ago to its lowest in three years to 700 tons as record high prices are seen dampening retail purchases, the World Gold Council said on Tuesday. Demand was 774 metric tons a year ago, the WGC said. Indian gold consumption in the April to June quarter fell about 7% to 158 metric tons, Reuters reported. Gold hit a record high of about 61,845 rupees per 10 grams in the quarter, the WGC said. Meanwhile, the markets were down too, and I mean the stock markets, on the first day of the month of August. The S&P BSE Sensex closed 68 points lower at 66,459, while the Nifty 50 declined 20 points to end at 19,733. Doing business and going to jail. The Indian Post Office Act of 1898 originally extended to all of British India, Upper Burma, British Baluchistan, Santan, Parganas and Pargana of Spiti. Now, the good news is that offences under this very act have now been removed under a bill passed last week, which is of course in 2023, only about 125 years later. There are of course many more such laws and punishments lurking around in the deepest recesses of Indian law books, many dating back as far as well. Of the 1,536 laws that govern doing business in India, more than half carry imprisonment clauses. Of the 69,000 compliances that businesses have to follow, almost 40% or 2 out of every 5 carry imprisonment clauses. More than half the clauses requiring imprisonment carry a sentence of at least one year, according to a report that I'll come to shortly. Arrests and jail are not common or likely in many of these cases, but the prospect of it or the power to do so obviously spurs corruption. The Lok Sabha or India's lower house of parliament last week passed the Jan Vishwas bill with six amendments recommended by a joint parliamentary committee. The Jan Vishwas, which you could translate as People's Trust, aims to promote ease of doing business and ease of living. Ease of doing business is something the present government has put much energy into to address for businesses large and small. There is of course some question about delivering on all these promises. Now, the bill proposes to amend some 183 provisions to be decriminalized in 42 central acts administered by 19 ministries and departments. Obviously, that's a lot. Piyush Goyal, the Ministry of Commerce and Industry, said in Parliament that as many as 40,000 provisions and procedures that can potentially impact people, that's you and me, have been either removed or simplified by the government in the last nine years. This bill was tabled in Parliament in December last year. Through the bill, the government has converted several fines into penalties in some provisions. It's also removed imprisonment and fine in some provisions. And in certain provisions, it's removed imprisonment but retained fines. And some, while the fine has been announced, imprisonment has been removed. The compounding of offences is proposed to be introduced in a few provisions. Compounding of offences, as you might know or have seen, is feasible already in some cases under income tax as well as securities markets. One area that has already seen some pushback is offences relating to misbranded or not of standard quality or NSQ drugs. The bill converts all of these into compoundable offences, meaning that the accused can escape jail time upon payment of a fine of 5 lakh rupees. The nature of the penal consequence of an offence committed should be commensurate with the seriousness of the offence, the government has said. To understand whether this bill in its present form is a good move and how far we still have to go, I reached out to Gautam Chikarmane, Vice President at Observer Research Foundation, who authored a report or a paper on this subject titled Jailed for Doing Business last year, along with Rishi Agarwal, co-founder and CEO of Team Lee's RegTech. I began by asking Gautam what he thought of the Jan Vishwas bill at this point. This is a very important act, not in terms of how it is structured at this current moment. I look at it as some form of a structure for future reforms. You have read our earlier report where we talked about 26,134 imprisonment clauses in business laws alone. Now, this bill, when it first came and then went to the standing committee and now has been passed by Lok Sabha and awaiting Rajya Sabha and then President's assent and then it will be finally notified, is statistically speaking and for Puritans like us, at least the scholars, it's nothing, it's not even the tip of the ice. It's maybe a snowflake uh, at the tip of the ice. But when we see it as a directional act, then I see that this can be a format for bringing all the other 
reforms or all the other, let us say, rationalizations of compliances. So this becomes a format, this becomes a structure, this becomes a starting point. It has ignited a series of reforms. This is not the reform. But of course, as scholars and as uh, commentators, we are one step behind politics and the political economy and the atmosphere there. So we need to have sensitivity towards it. So what I can say is that out of 26,134, if there are 183 provisions and even among them, only 113 pertain to employer compliance, to business compliances, this is not a very big step. So while the Puritan in me is somewhat disappointed, the optimist in me is excited that this can be the structure for future compliance reforms. And if you were to now look at the other 26,000 or 25,000 something now remaining, where would you say are the maximum residing in? And therefore, you know, if we fix those first, you know, the absolute number may not matter as much, but the quality of those interventions might matter more. In our study, we had discovered that around 70% of all the imprisonment clauses, 60 to 70% are in the labor laws. At that time, there were 43 labor acts at the union level and several more uh, multiples of them at the state level through rules. Today, as you know, we have four labor codes. All the 43 laws have been encapsulated under four labor codes. But those codes have not yet been notified. The reason being that it seems the union government and the state government's labor ministries are in negotiations with one another as to which rules to be decriminalized and which to be retained. By the way, Govind, we have never suggested in our paper or in our monograph that all the imprisonment clauses need to be removed. No, we are not saying that. We have never stated that. In fact, we have gone out of our way to say that maybe there are some, you can see a willful destruction of environment or a willful evasion of taxes. Those, of course, will remain and should remain criminalized. But random provisions, for instance, if you don't paint the inside walls of your uh, toilets of latrines, I mean, that's the exact words, once every three months, you can be jailed. Or if you don't, reconstitute the canteen committee once every two years despite the canteen contractor providing you fantastic service uh, then you can be jailed and these are the provisions that need to go these are frivolous provisions having said that very few people have been jailed because of these provisions so what it has created this entire edifice of laws rules and regulations under them is the inspector raj corruption it has given great power in the hands of lower bureaucrats to extract rent-seeking, etc. These need to go. But we have never said that you need to remove all of them. So how are you seeing uh, the passage of this, which you referred to earlier uh, in the next couple of years, in achieving or converging towards the larger goal of eliminating even more such laws? What I see is that Rajya Sabha should pass it very soon. It will get presidential assent after that, and then it will be gazetted into a notification, which will create a pathway for all the other laws, for instance, the Metrology Act or the Factories Act, Labor Codes, etc., to follow. I am hopeful and my reading of the situation is that right from the top, right from the PMO down to the uh, Ministry of Commerce under DPIIT, there is a political enthusiasm for this. But at the bureaucratic level, I still see resistance. Right, Gautam. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. Pleasure to talk to you, Govin. The movie conundrum. Box offices are feeling pressure world over and now in India. We spoke last week of how the Hollywood pipeline is drying up because of strikes by writers and actors there, while the Bollywood pipeline does not look set to deliver any high-value hits this year. Life after Oppenheimer, Mission Impossible and Barbie looks a little quiet it appears. Multiplex chain PVR Inox on Tuesday reported a consolidated net loss of 82 crore rupees for the quarter ended June 30th versus a net profit of 53 crore rupees for the same quarter last year. Now this is despite a 11% increase in patrons visiting the cinemas at around 34 million, a slightly higher average ticket price of 246 rupees and a 9% higher food and beverage spend at around 130 rupees. So, revenue from operations were up 32% to about 1,304 crores, but losses were high or up because of a sharp rise in expenses. And before I go, aviation news and the form of another international airline from India getting set to fly overseas. New kid on the block, Akasa Air, has brought in its 20th aircraft, fulfilling the mandate of the National Civil Aviation Policy 2016 
which requires an airline to have 20 aircraft in its fleet to start international operations. Akasa has 19 aircraft in its fleet and has placed an order for 76 more, of which 23 are the Boeing 737 MAX 8, while the other 53 would be the Boeing or the B737-8200, reports have said. Now, the 737-8200, being the 20th aircraft of Akasa, will be the first such model in India. And that's it from me for today. Have a great day ahead and see you tomorrow, same time. And do write in to us with your comments and feedback on govindraj at thecore.in. Bye for now. This was The Core Report with me, Govindraj Ethiraj. Do stay connected with more of our coverage at The Core. You can check out our website or sign up to our newsletter at www.thecore.in. That is www.thecore.in or follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter and Facebook as well. Now, we would love your feedback on how we can make business more interesting and relevant to you, including our reporting on India's vibrant manufacturing sector. Write to us at feedback at the core.in. Thank you for listening. <laughs>